Welcome to episode 29 of The Wheelhouse. I am Andrew, and man, I am really, really excited to record this episode. I'm also a little sad, which I'll get to why. Actually, I'll talk about them now. So this is the last episode of the summer, which means the last episode in Maryland, which means last in my lovely home in Maryland. Um, this Saturday, I'll be flying back out to Dallas, where I'll be going to school and whatnot. But do not worry, this show shall continue. Um, I've got things planned for the sort of return show to Dallas. I don't want to say too much just yet. Suffice to say, there are special things, things that don't normally happen on a podcast that will occur um, next Wednesday. Uh, but now I feel like, um, I, I, I feel both in a good mood and a bad mood, or should I say weird mood, uh, that, that temporal mush, which uh, has been mentioned on the show before. Um, I'm in the middle of right now. You know, flying out Saturday. Um, got a few days until then. And, you know, I feel like I can't do anything big. You know, I can't start, you know, Game of Thrones Season 1, Episode 1. Because, you know, I'm not going to be able to finish that. Got to deal with school in a bit. That would be a, a foolish move. Um, don't feel like I could start to commit to a big video game. Um, because, again, it's going to be broken up by a lot of stress moving in and adjusting the classes and whatnot. Um, but it's far enough out where I can't pack yet. Um, I've been mentally thinking about what I need to, but it's like, um, I can't pack my clothes because, you know, I still got to wear them. Um, so it's, it's in that weird middle ground. Um, and yeah, it's weird, but things have happened this past week, especially today that have uh, made things a little easier. Um, non sequitur while it's on my mind. I just wanted to say that the setup I have right now in my room that I've uh, been recording for for the last three or so months um, has been awful. Um, I don't even have a desk in my room um, because after I sort of moved out for college my freshman year, I sort of got demoted to the basement. And while, yes, it's very nice, there's a lot of media entertainment, which I am surrounded by constantly, uh, which feels good. Um, It's not a proper room room um one thing there's no windows so as far as sleep goes that kind of messes me up because um that circadian rhythm is all off there's no sunrise to tell me to sort of ease up on that deep sleep it's deep sleep all the way until an alarm wakes me up or i'm so guilty for having slept until 10 a.m that um the guilt is what uh makes me rise up in the morning but yeah no desk i actually record on the stressor which is very, very annoying because uh, it's a dresser and there's no like space to push my chair and have my feet on there. I'm always kind of like slanted um, with my feet out to the side um, with these shelves in the way for me getting close to the mic. So I'm kind of like contorted looking to my notes on the side, looking at levels on my laptop in front of me, mic also in front of me. So my head's always tilted. Um, it's horrible. So I'm actually very, very excited to get back to Dallas because I know that the rooms in Dallas, uh, they have desks. And desks are very nice to have, especially for podcasting. And actually, I'm just excited to go back in general. I know the last two summers, it's like, oh, summer's over. Gotta, gotta go back to school. I've had enough of school. Um, just want to stay home and, you know, read books, watch movies, that sort of jam. Uh, but I'm actually uh, eager to go back, which is not something uh, I've felt in spades before, but which I am now. Um and I think, is that a good thing? I don't know. Well, I know it's a good thing in that one reason I do want to go back is because I have ideas for short films I want to do. And man, this past summer was, uh, if anything could galvanize you to, to make short films, it's uh, being on a set for a feature length film for two and a half plus weeks. And you know, it was kind of just nice to go and shoot something, some five minute thing in an apartment instead of, you know, what will turn out to be an hour and a half film that you had to sit around in a hundred degree uh, heat in plain sun with no shade cover for many, many a day. Um, you know, it's the little things in life that that pull you through. This show must go on. Speaking of shows, this is a very, very theatric episode of The Wheelhouse um, for two main reasons, for the two main topics I am talking about today. One of them is the main review. Uh, if you 
listen to the recommendation last week, then you already know what it is. But what I'm talking about first is uh, something I experienced a couple days ago. I went and saw The Phantom of the Opera. Uh, the play it was going on at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Um, went with my immediate family, uh, my grandmother, and my uncle's family. So it was the 10 of us. Um, my uncle had some special deals, so we ended up getting great, great seats um, in a booth, which was really nice. Um, it's a... Uh, it seemed very exclusive because, like, there's um, this little door that is just for that booth. And then you go through and there's, like, this little, like, receptacle area. No, not receptacle is not the right word. Uh, like a vestibule, kind of. Um, and then you open that and then you're in the booth. Um, and it's very, very cozy. There's, like, eight. No, there's obviously there's ten seats. And they're not, like, pinned down. You could actually move them around in the booth however which way you want. Um, you can see everything really well. Um, yeah, and it was, I've seen the Kennedy Center before. Um, I forget the specific name for this event, but every once in a while they honor, um, you know, artists, uh, musicians, other, you know, esteemed people. Um, and with musicians, they come on, honor them and they have other musicians perform covers of their songs and you get the president in there, you know, being all cool and like, uh, they're at their center booth, you know, singing along and whatnot. So I've seen it before. And I never thought I'd be there, but I was, uh, to see The Phantom of the Opera. And, uh, truth be told, I wanted to hate it. I wanted to hate the show going in. And to understand why, you have to uh, know my history with Phantom of the Opera. Um, my first exposure to Phantom was the 2004 Joel Schumacher movie uh, starring Amy Rossum and Gerard Butler. And watched it as a kid, and I absolutely loved it. I actually looked up the running time. It's like two and a half hours, um, which for me now is like a big commitment. I got to block off two and a half plus hours and then sit and just watch a movie. But at the time, man, it felt like nothing. Um, absolutely loved it. Loved the songs. Loved the story. Um, it was completely uh, whisked away into that world. Um, but... As I grew older, I heard things. I heard that there was a uh, critical contingent that considered the play to be bad. And I was aghast. I'm like, what? Phantom of the Opera? Bad? What are you talking about? All the songs are great. And whatnot. Um, and ever the curious contrarian and currently critical cinephile, um, part of me was like, hmm, if all these you know fancy academics are saying Phantom's no good, you know, it's probably no good. And I should go in and pick out things so when I come out, I could be like, yeah, it's no good. And these are the reasons why. Um, but um, I knew that that was not fair. So I went in with an open mind. But it's hard because, you know, I had that past with it. So there is that level of uh, nostalgia playing against you. But uh, when I walked out, I thought, uh, you know, I'm kind of mixed on fandom of the opera and it's kind of tough with theater because you know there's different performances they put on shows different places with different casts um different sets so when i'm reviewing critiquing this it's just this particular uh performance at the kennedy center um let's start with the positives one thing that i was very surprised by uh was humor the movie is uh as i recall is utterly humorless um which isn't a bad thing um but yeah, there are moments of levity here, which I was surprised by, um, that work well. Um, and in general, what works is it being performed on a stage. Band of the Opera works so much better on stage than film. Um, it was built for the stage. There are a lot of times where they play um, on that. You know, they, they don't fully go break the fourth wall in a sense. But, you know, they have people, you know, amid the audience who, you know, act as well. In the whole chandelier gimmick also, it being in the theater. Um, and yeah, it's kind of surreal to see a theater um, on a theater stage kind of addressing theater audience that is both existing there as the audience to the Phantom of the Opera, but also on a fictional level being the audience in the French, you know, plot play thing. Um, it's cool. It's neat. Um set design 
uh, was really nice, like the uh, chandelier I mentioned. Uh, really, really cool effects they do there, especially with some power technic uh, voodoo. Um, and there's a 360 rotating set, um, which they use sometimes, which is really, really impressive. Imagine like a giant cylinder on the stage and it rotates and sometimes pieces open up and there's like rooms inside. Sometimes it rotates and just the whole side becomes a backdrop. Um, really, really impressive. Uh, costuming, lighting, solid, uh, blocking, conservative, but effective. Um, yeah. A lot of, lot of good fundamentals down. But some of my negatives or critiques, you can call. Um, the three leads playing Christine, Phantom, and Raul. Um, their performances uh, vocally, um, they were satisfactory. Um, they weren't mind-blowing at all. Even the uh, actress playing Christine was apparently a stand-in for the stand-in. Um, not saying that's makes her bad or anything. Um, but again, that goes to the whole illusion li- or issue for me. Is like, am I watching the best version of this? Um, not seeing like the, you know, the lead in the role. Anyway, uh, their performances, uh, their, their characters seem very young. You know, I even think the uh, actor for the Phantom was apparently like a finalist on The Voice or something. And at times their uh, voices sound very poppy, you know, kind of contemporary. And especially for Phantom, who should have, you know, a more old, you know, and consequently, like, wise and mysterious sort of voice, um, wasn't there. Um, but the acting it was something that I think could really have been better. It was very stiff at times. Uh, sometimes, like, no chemistry between the three characters. Especially, that's a pretty problematic when, you know, the big, you know, plot point is a love triangle between the three. You gotta have some chemistry. Um... Some plot points were confusing, um, and the only reason I knew what was happening is because I was familiar with the plot from the movie. And I, I seriously think that if I had not known any of the story beforehand, I would be really, really lost um, with some some moments that they did not communicate well. Um, and the orchestration was uh, good overall, but there were times where I thought it was a little thin. Um, like on the big songs, um, like the main fan of the op- uh, song, um, Whole orchestra's playing, blast through the auditorium, sounds great. But there's some moments where it's primarily strings, and there are a lot of strings um, in these arrangements that it felt like uh, it was a little thin. Like I needed a more robust string section to really uh, pull through the whole thing. But to the meat of the performance, you gotta talk about the songs and the story. Let's start with the story while well, we're on the negatives. I know that's kind of mean, but it's kind of true. Um, yeah. I did not think it was a problem watching the movie as a kid. Um, and yeah, all the main plot points are the same for the uh, theatrical performance. And yeah, it's it's pretty darn shallow. Um, characters are two-dimensional. Christine, pretty dull character, very passive. Um, and she is just found over by two guys and she has to pick one that she loves more. That's pretty much her whole character. Phantom... A stereotypical broken artist who finds his muse and is obsessed. Um, Raul, well, he's Raul. Um, he spends half the film going like, oh, where's Christine? Where's Christine? Oh, there she is. I love you. Oh, where's Christine? Um, besides the well-established love triangle between the three, you don't really know anything about them. Um, and that's a problem because then they make decisions and there's no established reason to their motivations. So it's just kind of like, oh, well, anything goes because we don't really know what goes sensibly for these characters um and that might be in part with the acting because the supporting cast is uh i think a lot more entertaining they're more personable and vibrant in their performances um which is kind of a shame uh, because they are not the leads but when it comes to songs love them songs love all the songs that's that nostalgia talking and i can't get it out um when you when you know with the criticisms that I mentioned before, like the, the academic sort of cr- uh, criticisms about the story being shallow and the songs being sappy, um, sort of really overblown or even opulent. Um, man, I'll I'll drink that sap all day long because it tastes tastes so good. Um, yeah, I wonder if it was the first time I heard those songs, I'd be like, man, this is really, you know, mawkish. But uh, man, I can't get enough. Point of no return, music of the night. 
my top two favorite. I listen to those all the time. Um, and yeah, it's very interesting how sort of nostalgia can can work for and against you. Um, and and yeah, I, at this point, like I like the film. You know, maybe I'll always like the film more than any performance. You know that they could do in the theater. Which yeah, come at me, purist. Um, if that's not the real way to enjoy Phantom of the Opera. Um, but you know, it's just the order of things and you just got to deal. Anyway, if you think you've had enough of theatrics for one night, you are in for a lot more because of how the show works. Every week, there's a recommendation, a piece of media, like a book, a movie, TV show, an album. I go out and then I experience it, come back here. Uh, give my review, and then there's another recommendation. And last week, there was a very, very interesting recommendation. Uh, today, I am talking about WWE. Um, yes, that is wrestling, pro wrestling. Um, and I was very skeptical going in, especially when I first heard that this is what I had to talk about. Um, skeptical, as most people are, of it in general. And for the rest of their lives. Um, but I'd like to begin by thanking the recommender, Joe, for recommending WWE. Um, if you follow the show, you know the usual sort of topics are, you know, movies, you know, albums, that sort of thing. And yeah, movie. I'll watch a movie. Album. Yeah, I'll go listen to that. Um, there's no joy in the act of sort of beginning to watch or beginning to listen or beginning to play. Um, Not to say that the actual film or video game or book is enjoyable in itself. It's just that the the medium um, that it inhabits is old hat. Which is not to say, like, I'm never going to get sick of movies. I'm never going to get sick of, uh, you know, playing video games. Um, But there's sort of, there's a routine in engaging in that activity. Um, yeah, had completely new experience with wrestling. Uh, you could argue, hey, it's just like TV, you know, you just, you know, watch, watch on your TV. Um, but it, it, it exists in its, its own sort of universe, you can say. Um, and yeah, uh, I haven't had a lot of time to, to marinate on, you know, what I've seen. I've seen, I've seen stuff. Um, I haven't had time to think about it. You know, what I've seen also uh, in comparison to all the other stuff I've talked about this past summer. Um, But as of right now, as of me talking in the middle of emotion, being very pumped up, even though it's past midnight. um, Yeah, this has been, uh, this may well be the best recommendation I've gotten um, this this whole summer. And in part because it it was so surprising and it had such a turnaround for me being a hater to a lover. Um, yeah, and just from, from a standpoint of just pure enjoyment, um, nothing, nothing beat it. Um, and I've got to say, I am absolutely terrified, um, of this review because it is a colossal task, uh, to sort of boil down a full day's worth of, you know, hyper masculine, uh, melodrama into, you know, a, a little monologue by a noob. Um, but, uh, what I am talking about are three specific, uh, sort of events that, that Joe recommended. Well, he recommended two specifically, and then I watched one, uh, for, you know, in ring show. I don't even know the terminology, but, um, first thing I saw was a video by Max Landis called Wrestling Isn't Wrestling, and then, uh, a Royal Rumble, uh, from 2010, and then I watched the WWE SmackDown um, that aired on August 16th, the day before this podcast comes out. Um, So, a lot to talk about. Let's begin with uh, some context. Not wrestling as in wrestling, some context about me uh, and wrestling. My history with wrestling is non-existent. Um, Yeah, never watched wrestling growing up. Um, I knew or I know you know, some of the big names, like, you know, Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Rock, John Cena, 
Macho Man, uh, Randy Savage. And these are reasons, I, I know these because they sort of penetrated past uh, just the wrestling sort of culture into mainstream pop culture. Um, the only other thing I could really think of was uh, the film The Wrestler uh, with Mickey Rourke. Um, and that's about, well, his character is an aging wrestler. And he's sort of dealing with the fact that, you know, sort of things are changing in his career. And also he's getting old and he's getting weak and he's got real life problems to deal with. Um, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. But if anything, it reinforced the idea, the very famous notion that uh, wrestling is fake. Um, and yeah, I had held that belief that it was just full of dimwit opposers who were gesticulating for the masses. Um, yeah. You can see I was jaded, um, but Max Landis is incredibly enlightening. Wrestling isn't wrestling. Um, turn me around. Um, Landis makes an argument in a very elegant and entertaining form. Um, and instead, instead of what could have just been like a classic clickbait rant, um, instead he does something really cool. He presents his case, you know, saying that, hey, if you say wrestling's fake, that isn't the whole story. It's very reductionist. Um, it's self-consciously fake, which is a very big distinction. It never aims to be authentic in the typical sense. Um, it's really, really about characters, stories, and sort of all this wrapped in, you know, very theatric performance. Um, very similar to something like comics or superhero movies. Um, I think Landis even uh, references Game of Thrones is sort of that level of dramatic storytelling um yeah to me that was that was a very novel idea to say the least and then what he does next um it's really cool he tells a two-decade tale of one triple h um who's apparently his favorite wrestler um triple h's journey to win the you know wwe championship um and it's full of these wacky side characters uh, alliances, betrayals, revenge, reveals, um, people getting married while unconscious. Um, and while this is all happening, Landis is constantly uh, narrating. Um, and what's cool is that what you see visually are primarily actresses playing the roles of real-life wrestlers. Um, and yeah, the acting is intentionally overacting. Um, the sets are all flashy, the costumes are super fancy, and the editing is just going at a break nest breakneck pace to follow up with you know Landis's um, enthusiasm um, and it parallels real life wrestling you know instead of you know Landis making his statement like you know wrestling isn't wrestling um, it's more than just uh, fake um, and here are the reasons why and then you're just going down a boring list of bullet points what he does is he tells a story um, his own version in a sense of one of the stories that you sort of see in uh, pro wrestling. Um, and boy, is it engrossing. Um, the way Landis tells it, you're just completely with Triple H um, all the way through, you know, his ups and downs. Um, and it's just a plain good story. Um, it's structured in classic story form. Um, and, you know, it's like 20 minutes long or something. It just doesn't feel like that. Um and Landis's final point at the end is how humans uh, crave stories because we're inherently bored. This is a topic that I love, love to think about, you know, why art exists, what purpose it serves society, that sort of thing, where creativity comes from. And yeah, there's a notion that we like to live vicariously through fictional characters, you know, on screen or otherwise. Sort of, it can be a power trip. Um, and we like emotion. We like to feel you know, without always it, uh, without always those emotions being close to home and being too real, you know? And yeah, that, that idea of it being too real, you know? Anytime you read a fictional book, watch an action movie, you know, play a survival horror, horror video game, they're all fake, you know, in a sense. Someone coded that game. Um, there were people on a set filming that on a green screen there was a guy who spent you know months and months in his attic on a typewriter writing up that book you know whatever you know fanciful you know interplanetary 
you know, environment or crazy um, science fiction races or, you know, interpersonal family drama that you see in fiction, it's all sort of made up. It's a coalition of um, ideas that sort of creators culminated together to sort of present in a way that is believable on our authentic in a level that we can appreciate in that sort of sense of living through it vicariously and experience, you know, sort of fake real emotions. And that's why wrestling works. Um, it's ridiculous, yeah, but it knows it's ridiculous and it takes full advantage of it. Um, and yeah, that is something that uh, was new to me, but turned out to be very, very important. With that mindset, I went in and watched my next event of wrestling, and that would be the Royal Rumble from 2010. And I've got to say, uh, whoever came up with the idea for this uh, should be president, um, because that's that's really uh, one guy who's coming up with you know ideas that that are good for the whole country. Um, uh, here's how it works: uh, every 30 seconds, a wrestler enters the ring. Um, you are eliminated if you are thrown out of the ring and your feet touch the floor, and it's down to last man standing. Um, it really is the most muscular game of the floor is lava. Um, now, you can't enjoy Royal Rumble or wrestling, I guess, in general, uh, if you go in thinking just it's fake. Uh, with Royal Rumble, uh, yeah, the concept is inherently unfair. Whoever is out first uh, has to deal with, you know, 29 other guys while while number 30 just shows up at the end and just has to, like, you know, last for a minute. Uh, yeah, if, if you think that wrestling has, you know, that you know, affectation of being a legitimate, you know, sport, then you'd be like, yeah, that, that's completely dumb, it's unfair, whatnot. No, you're wrong, my friend. Um, if you know, you know, that it's not just fake. It knows it's fake. Um, yeah, it works. Veritas vos liberabit, my friends. The truth will set you free. And suddenly, once you accept that fact, it just all falls into place. When Dolph Ziggler and Evan Bourne get on the ring and simultaneously turn their heads and eye their WrestleMania title and argue, that's mine, no, that's mine, it all makes sense. When CM Punk talks about saving his fellow wrestlers and preaches something about, you know, being a straight edge or something, it all makes sense. When eight wrestlers duke it out like a Black Friday sale at a vitamin world, it all makes sense. And not only that, it feels so good. Um, Royal Rumble uh, is a great entry point. Uh, Joe is completely right. It introduces you to so many wrestlers. Um, and I recognize a few uh, from the Landis video, Wrestling Isn't Wrestling, uh, like Triple H, Shawn Michaels. Um, and then I realized, watching it, you know, the, the video Wrestling Isn't Wrestling, paired with my first experience with, you know, wrestling, uh, reminded me of Metal Gear Solid and how that that story for that series has started from the original Metal Gear, which I think was like late 80s, like 86 or 88 or something. And that story has been continuous up to present day. And if you haven't stuck with the uh, you know story since day one, uh, that thing is so convoluted. It is so hard to get in and just make sense of any of it. And even if you have played the games, you know, there's sometimes the games, there's long gaps between the games that's so long that you forget, you know, what happens. Um, you have to be at the top of your game to, to understand all the, you know, crazy reveals and double reveals and backtracking and retcons and all that nonsense. Um, but then there are videos, you know, that, that are out on the internet of not just Metal Gear, but in general for like long series that do like, oh, here's the whole story in five minutes, you know, for you who forgot or for you who wants to catch up or for you who hasn't experienced anything and want to know a little bit before you delve in to the deep end. And yeah, just like that, um, it was like 
you know, here's, you know, with the wrestling as in wrestling, here's like this very cursory, you know, dive into pro wrestling. And then going in, you're just like, oh, you know, I know these few things. I remember seeing this in the video. It's kind of, it's kind of fun. Like if you did that thing with Metal Gear, like, oh, like I still am lost, you know, still don't feel like I'm completely a part of it because I haven't followed it since the beginning. But when things do make sense, like you do, you know, like recognize things, it feels good. Um, and there is a sense of discovery in that, that is a joy in itself. Um, and there's a, a joy in being confused because um, sometimes the madness just overwhelms you. And sometimes uh, just letting go and letting it surround you is uh, very, very pleasurable. But yeah, I was 100% invested in the Royal Rumble. Um, yeah, after the first few wrestlers, I was really like, who's going to win? I wanted to know. And it's it's funny. I, at the time, I'm like, oh, you know, sometimes some of the hits. You know, this is all choreographed. Um, sometimes some of the hits you know, don't look, you know, they don't land in the way they should to make them appear like they really made contact. Sometimes, you know, some of the acting is a little overblown. But, you know, never really, because I got past the point of, you know, just it being plainly fake. That There was never a point where I was like, man, this, th- there's no stakes in it for me because it's already sort of predetermined who's going to win. I never really thought that. I was really like, I want to know what the outcome is. And I'm almost pretty much at the edge of my seat. It is a combination of getting past that, you know, mental obstacle. It is also a combination of sort of the presentation of it being sort of amped up to be some some you know, monumental performance. And also uh, a big thing is the actual wrestling. You know, it is choreographed, but it is well choreographed. It is really, really impressive at times. Like some of the moves that they pull off and knowing that, knowing now that they have to do that and be safe is sort of also impressive in itself that they have to like throw around these body huge bodies that can easily injure someone else or especially themselves and do their best to not and generally it seems like they don't um like at least severely injure each other man that's i wonder how much time they had to put into to doing that um reminded me of the movie that i i love uh called warrior it has uh joel edgerton and Tom Hardy, and it's about the, both of them, they're in uh, MMA fighting, and he yeah, was watching some of the behind the scenes of them having to train, and make the moves look realistic while also being safe, um, it's very much the same thing in a sense, but it, there's that, uh, you know, prejudice against wrestling, because um, never in the movie you go, oh, you know, I'm not feeling anything, because I know that both these actors were trained, you know, they had they took lessons, and they did this, you know, with the cameras rolling and lights everywhere and medical staff on standby in case they get hurt. You don't think that, even though it, that's that's sort of true. Um, but wrestling, there's that there is that prejudice. But again, man, you just Joe was preaching to me about wrestling. Now I'm preaching out there to the ether, to whoever's listening. That get over, you know, that phrase. Wrestling is fake. Get over it. Or at least add on to it, you know, with what I've talked about ad nauseum um, in just this short time. And finally, the last thing I'm talking about for WWE was SmackDown Live for August 16th. Um, I was excited. Live event. Um, I actually wanted to watch Raw the night before, but I had a family engagement. Couldn't do that. Um, but boy, um, yeah. One one show was all I needed to uh, get me hooked, you can say. It was more of what I expected, which turned out to be also the same as what I wanted. Um, now, I watched this, you know, a few hours ago, so I don't have my notes for this completely organized. But, um, yeah, just in general, I have much of the same feelings as I have in already stated, especially concerning with the Royal Rumble. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to just go through um, the notes I have as the show went on. Um, and sorry if it's not as, you know, cohesive as, um, you know, what I've said before or just the show in general, but, um, 
yeah, I in it because all the main points are are going to be the same. But um, yeah, and I was texting Joe, you know, while watching the show, and yeah, apparently I picked a, a good time to jump in, especially this one. It turned out to be uh, pretty great. Um, so we start off, and all of my first note under SmackDown uh, is Big Pickle. I think it was Randy Orton and Heath Slater. Um, I think that's his name, and they're arguing. About something again. That's sort of a thing of jumping in. I don't know exactly what they're arguing about, but I knew, I knew they had beef. Um, and something about there are also two suits there, and something about signing contract. And the Heath was all you know, butt hurt about not getting one. Fun setup. Um, more drama. The good old drama that I love. Um, next. Oh my goodness. There's a talk show by this guy, Miss TV, who is quite a character. Gets a lot of booze. Um, one of them. Uh, unpopular characters i forget face or heel i know one's good one's bad but i don't know um anyway uh he has uh, dean ambrose and dolph ziggler show up and man uh yeah some of that acting was actually pretty good they get pretty impassioned uh they start arguing at each other um and I, you know what's interesting is that yeah i don't know exactly what their beef is but they do a good job of uh throwing in hints of exactly you know, what it is and what's going to happen in the future. Man, if I had a dime for every time one of them mentioned like, oh yeah, I'm so looking forward to, you know, the sum- the SummerSlam this Sunday, or, you know, uh, I've been training all, all this past month for the SummerSlam this Sunday. You know, there are a lot of hints in there, which, uh, you know, is kind of funny. Um, but yeah, that Dolph Ziggler gets really impassioned, his face is turning red, veins popping out. Um, yelling into the mic, and then all of a sudden he kicks uh, Dean Ambrose in the head, which I love. That was so, so funny. And also in the argument, what I love is that the good old PG rating, you know. I think Dolph Ziggler one one point says, like, you shut your mouth. I'm like, oh, that's so, you know, hilarious, you know, because, you know, going back to to Mac Delanders' video, I think he said at one point that, it wasn't wrestling wasn't rated at one point so they could do a lot of get away with a lot of you know more risque and dirty stuff but now they gotta you know curry to the kids and it makes them for some humorous moments at time and uh man they had so much passion in their argument and you know i just i I sort of expected them just drop their mics and then uh just make out didn't happen but a kick to the face is a a good consolation prize and by that point yeah i'm completely glued to the screen um yeah, and there was a literal mic drop, mic drop, after that kick to the face. Um, next, there's a 12 man tag team. Which after watching Royal Rumble, um, yeah, I feel like I there's there's always got to be, you know, a huge you know mass of meat flopping around. Um, I gotta have it. Um, and yeah, these names for these teams are just so ridiculous. The Vaude Villains, Hype Bros, who are bros. Um, Brizango, who carried around a furry selfie stick. Um, if anybody goes in and calls wrestling fake and just walks away, they're missing out on some uh, crazy stuff. Um, and then they're fighting, you know, and they're tagging in, tagging out. And then all of a sudden there's like a riot pretty much when they all, 12 of them, jump in the ring. And then it cuts to commercial. And I was like, what? Um, and this happened a few times. Again, this is something I'm sure happens all the time, but I'm not used to. Um, and I was very, very sad because when uh, the show came back, you know, most of the guys were already out outside of the ring, you know, flopping around the floor all hurt. I'm like, I missed, I missed it, um, which is funny. You know, I'm invested in it now. Um, so there's commercials and that I, things happen and I miss it. Um, also love the inner match drama, sort of that locker room footage you know of guys being angry or getting ready to fight um that's when sort of the really really bad um really really scripted moments come out but they're so good they're so good um my next note here says football in all caps um sort of a comparison to football with you know just it being primarily and, you know, sort of cater to, to a male audience. You know, you have sort of the big draw are, you know, men doing manly things um, and sort of showing off that uh, athleticism. 
and then you know you you know there's also the thing that also made me make that comparison is uh, I think the next match uh, had you know female wrestlers and you know on, on the football side where do you see most of the ladies are you know on the sidelines as cheerleaders and I was thinking like now is that sort of the same thing in this instance where it's just sort of you know women here sort of as a pretty face to just you know to to continually cater to that male dominated audience and then it led me to think well is WWE sexist now I am not an expert on sexism nor WWE but I like to think about these things um like I said haven't had a lot of top time to think about it so hopefully I don't say anything too offensive but yeah the first thing I did jump to was maybe you know it's like football and they're you know just there for show but then you know they do have a couple matches and they do have all the same features as the male wrestlers they have their own you know walkout music they have their own names costumes and they do perform stunts in the ring um of course they are nowhere near the status of, you know, the big headliners. Um, but, you know, I came to realize, you know, they, they, they're, you know, there is a matter of sexualization, which my mind jumped to immediately. But the men are, you know, sort of sexualized in the same way. They're big, bulky, sweaty bodies in, like, Speedos to accentuate, you know, their big, bulky, sweaty bodies. Um, how is that different than, you know, scantily clad women pulling each other's hair for our amusement um and then I asked my my sister about it like is it would you just the very little knowledge we have like would you think it's sexist and all she said was you know well if they're paid the same it's okay you know and that's something I don't know about but you know just from the little I've just from that pure performance I've seen it seems like they are if not equal footing close and during one of the commercial breaks they did champion um the sort of documentary that they have about sort of the rise of the women wrestlers to to being sort of a sideshow to to being uh to the main show to be uh sort of equally uh presented with the male wrestlers yes it is something that um i don't know enough about but uh it was something uh notable uh enough for me to to bring up I want to bring up nonsense um, that I didn't think mattered. Um, and yeah, there, but back to sort of what actually happened during Slam, uh, slam Down, Slam Down, SmackDown. That's, that goes to show how much I know. SmackDown. Uh, there is one uh, female wrestler, Eva Marie, and apparently her thing is to uh, have reasons to not actually wrestle or even show up at all. And the first time it seems like she's going to wrestle. Uh, apparently she's stuck in traffic and doesn't show up. But then she later does, but she doesn't even wrestle. She kind of stands around judging the other, you know, wrestlers wrestling. Um, very, very odd character. Uh, again, goes back to the whole thing of me not knowing uh, sort of the history and past of all these wrestlers. But it is uh, intriguing nonetheless. Next, you have Randy Orton versus Heath Slater, who we saw at the beginning uh, get in and on with the mean faces. Um, yeah, and the skits are so funny. Um, and yeah, most of the match was Orton throwing around Slater like a rag doll. Um, but apparently then it turns out he was disqualified, Randy, for not obeying the ref rules. Kind of confused there. Um, but that, uh, superstar contract that they hand Heath on this super 72 size font so the camera can see, um, on one single eight and a half by 11 piece of computer paper is the most hilarious prop I've seen in a long time. Um, yeah, I want that thing. Um, cause there's, there's nothing that says good news, like a contract that's one page long. Um, next there was a match, uh, Eric Rowan and Dean Ambrose. Now Dean Ambrose, I've, I came to learn, you know, through the show that he is like the, you know, heavyweight champion and whatnot right now and that they're going to fight for the title in SummerSlam on Sunday. Again, probably got a few facts wrong there, but whatever. Um, but the Eric Rowan, who I'm not sure if he's the guy in uh, the beard who fought or the guy in the chair who rocks in the chair. 
Um, I think they mentioned something about a Wyatt uh, family. I'm really, really confused about this one, especially the guy in the rocking chair. He's got a beard and a lantern. Looks like he belongs in Duck Dynasty. And then at the end, he kind of disavows or disowns uh, Rowan because he lost. And so just uh, symbolically places uh, Rowan's bunny mask uh, on his rocking chair and leaves. Um, That sounds like a fever dream. And quite possibly could be. But, um, again, who thinks that this is supposed to be real, you know? It is so... Yeah, it's surreal at times. But delightful all the time. Um, Next, another ladies match. um, Tag team, Carmella, uh, Becky Lynch, uh, Alexa Bliss, and Talia. And then Eva comes back. Uh, which I mentioned before, and then doesn't fight, but then joins the team, and Naomi comes back, who was the person who was supposed to fight Eva earlier, and she's mad, and stuff happens. Um, again, uh, confused many a time during the show, but that's not a bad thing. Um, it's all about that drama, which, again, jumping in uh, in the middle of things, in media res, you can say, um, is a joy unto itself. But finally, now, sort of some of the matches in the middle kind of lagged. It start, started off really strong, but then sort of they became a little bit more middling. But this finale was phenomenal. You have John Cena and Alberto Del Rio, which, again, show does a good job of filling you in if you don't know. I came to learn that uh, Alberto beat John Cena at one time, so this is sort of a rematch. And Cena's after revenge. Um, and Cena does win. Um, but during the whole match, you got this one AJ Styles giving the color commentary. And he's apparently going to fight Cena in SummerSlam. And he is just trash talking him through the whole match. But when Cena wins, AJ Styles ain't having none of it. Jumps on into the ring and beats up Cena. But then Cena comes around and beats up Styles, throws him out of the ring picks him up and throws him onto the commentator's desk, breaking it. Perfect ending. 10 out of 10. I want to give this show 10 out of 10. More like a 9 out of 10. Uh, now, I, you know, this being my first experience of wrestling, made quite an impression. We'll go 9.5 out of 10 on a scale of wonderful enjoyment. Um, Pat and that. The scale, Andrew O's scale of wonderful enjoyment. Now, there's a phrase I don't like too much. It's a... Uh, Turn your brain off. I hear this a lot, especially with my a lot of my family members. You know, they they know me as the you know the the you know critical movie guy, which I don't like that label, but it's what I've got. Um, I'm very critical of films, you know, and a lot of the mainstream films I, you know, I avoid because I hear, you know, and I read reviews saying you know this film is bad, um, and. You know, I follow sources and aggregates I trust, and I can make a, you know, a judgment call there. Say, you know, I'm not going to spend my time watching this because I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to enjoy it. And I would rather spend my time watching a good movie because there's only so much time in the world. Anyway, um, yeah, a lot of other my other family members, they, they love movies, but they don't have as much of a critical eye as I. Um, they will happily watch you know, Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 and say it was okay or fine. Um, I think I mentioned this with maybe with my dad. How, you know, any movie he watches, he generally, I ask him how he, how it is at the end, he just goes, oh, that was fine. Well, well it was okay. Um, which bothers me, but uh, I've come to sort of accept it at this point. Um, and when they say, you know, you know, why, why can't you enjoy, you know, a dumb comedy or, you know, a mindless action film. You know, they usually follow it by, you know, saying, sometimes you just gotta turn your brain off and watch, you know, Transformers for Age of Extinction or whatever it's called. Um, but I don't, I don't like to do that. I like to be, to be conscious, you know, when I consume my media. Um, but wrestling is weird. You know, it's not something I would expect to enjoy. Yes, I like a very good, uh, bad a good movie every once in a while but do i if i enjoy something that i kind of by all critical measures is bad if 
I enjoy that. Am I necessarily turning my brain off? Um, I'm not sure. Because is wrestling deep? Mm, not really. Is it like thematically hefty? Like some literary fiction? Eh, probably not. But um, will it provide you hours and hours of entertainment? And be completely engrossing and exhilarating and make you, you know, yell at the screen and just be completely wrapped away in the performances and theatrics and show and story that you're engaged with. Um, yeah. Hell yeah. Um, I, it was a, quite a surprise to, to enjoy it as much as I did. And... Am I watching that SummerSlam this Sunday? Uh, yes. I got that one free month of WWE Network and I'm going to get my money's worth. Um, and I know I'm going to enjoy it, which is which is the thing. I'm not doing... I don't have to watch it, you know? I only watch what I have to for, for the podcast, you know, to talk about it enough. But, you know, it's just... There's something about it. And there is something to be said for, for enjoying you know, anything and having that element of not being able to put your finger on why you like it, that makes it a little bit special. And for me at this point now, um, wrestling got a little bit of that magic. Um, and yeah, haven't done anything quite like it. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, as I'm talking right now, it's like one in the morning, but again, Got so bummed watching all that wrestling and I'm loving to talk about it. Don't feel too tired. Um, but now it is time for the next segment of our show. Um, it's where we have this guy named Jacob who knows nothing about music. He doesn't, he didn't even know who Bruce Springsteen was. And this past summer, we've been sort of educating him in a sense by going through um, what are considered some of the essential albums uh, that are out there. Uh, and we are nearing the end. And so this is probably, I think, yeah, this is the second to last uh, album that we'll be doing this summer. And that bit starts now. I am here with Jacob Estrada for what is actually the penultimate episode of Who is Bruce Springsteen. Holy crap, how did I get here? Um, I, I think you've, you've said that before in one of, one of the previous episodes. Um, Damn it. Yeah, did you <sighs> spend the last week trying to think of that? Uh, oh, no. I just like thought it out on the spot. Well, it wasn't wasn't that good. So try again next time. Hey, you know what? I don't see you coming up with anything. Okay. Uh, well, I, I do just uh make this show, <laughs> so uh, there's something there. <laughs> but we're here to talk about uh, an album that's very familiar with uh the wheelhouse, which is um the second album by Nirvana. Uh, never mind. And we did an entire episode uh, on Kurt Cobain and Nirvana. I believe it was episode seven. Uh, we talked about their three studio albums, um, their M- MTV Unplugged performance, and the documentary Montage of Heck. So while a lot of the stuff uh, we're going to cover today is sort of done before, uh, if you want a more in-depth uh, analysis of this topic, go ahead and listen to episode seven. But we do have Jacob here who, uh, you know, he's hasn't listened to this before, so we have sort of a different, fresh perspective to my, you know, old, seasoned one. So uh, let's begin with Jacob, first impressions. Uh, I really loved it, actually. Um, this might crack the top three. This might um, pass up Pink Floyd as, like, the number three album on this list. Yeah. Um... All right, so whether it's music or movies or books or whatever, uh, something I really like artistically is anything that anything that thrives off of stark juxtaposition. And uh, I know um, after like listening to this uh, these songs and like reading some reviews, Nirvana's known for um, their style of starting off really slow and then switching to a really intense chorus. And um, yeah, I just. Uh, with, with with any kind of work of art, I just love anything that contrasts really strong. 
And so right away, it just, it, it really hooked me. Yeah, for a uh, first song on the album. Um, yeah, it smells like Teen Spirit starts off with just that guitar and then the full band kicks in. Uh, yeah. It's kind of like uh, the, the Led Zeppelin, uh, the Black Dog song that you like so much. Uh, yeah, yeah, which might be why I liked it, like it so much because you know how much I like the Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. Um, I was also going to say I really love the guitar riffs in uh, in these songs. These uh, Most of these songs really thrive off the guitar riff, especially on, I think it was... Um, I think it was in Bloom that had a really kick-ass one. Yeah, and just in general, like a lot of the album has just a really great guitar riff. But like a lot of the songs also have surprising, like great melodies when it comes to vocals. Like in Bloom, too. Yeah, strong vocal or strong guitar riffs there. But also the melody for the chorus is just like inherently, like pretty. You know? Yeah. It's it's kind of we're going back to the whole idea of juxtaposition where you don't really expect that the raw sound of grunge to pair well with, you know, nice melodies, but uh, it they pull it off and it sounds great. Yeah, and um, another thing I love about these um, about these songs is, is this is another case where um, the lyrics, uh, <laughs> a lot of the time the lyrics seem nonsensical, even though I'm sure most of these songs, I know most of these songs do have um, deeper meanings behind them, but uh, they're, they're not at all straightforward. The lyrics... For a lot of these are just really confusing and weird. Like, um, I know uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit is known for being confusing and difficult to understand. And I know um, that I, I read online that uh, at first, lots of radio stations didn't want to play this song um, um, on their um, on air because... They just thought it was too confusing and that his uh, vocals were too difficult to understand. And they just had no idea what he was singing about. I mean, you can't get much more strange than a mulatto, an albino, a, <laughs> a mosquito, my libido, you know? <laughs> oh, speaking of which, yeah, the lyrics, a lot of these lyrics, um, I mean, I guess this is, goes with what I was just saying, but a lot of these lyrics are really weird, like in bloom. Uh, I think my favorite lyric in that song is... Nature is a whore. <laughs> like, most of the time, I have no idea what the fuck they're talking about. Uh, neither do I. So. <laughs> uh, and, um, see, I think probably my favorite, uh, my two favorite songs on the album, uh, before I turn it over to you, my two favorite songs are Breed and Lithium. Nice. Uh, good, good combo. Um, okay, thank you. I, I chose correctly, apparently. Um, so with Breed, I liked it because um, this one, uh, as opposed to the other ones, it was intense the entire time. It was just, uh, it, it started off really strong with that really crazy guitar riff, and it basically carries through the entire time. It, it doesn't stop to catch a breath, which uh, was really, just really invigorating to listen to. Um, I guess uh, after reading the Wikipedia page, it's supposed to be about being trapped in middle class America or something. I didn't get that at all from the lyrics, but um that's not why I chose the song. So um Lithium, this one I actually I actually really um got into the lyrics because the the song from what I understand from the lyrics and from what I read about it is about how uh religion is, tends to be a coping mechanism for people. Even if people um might believe something that doesn't make sense or is unfounded. It's it might be what they need in the moment. Uh, it's apparently about a man who turns to religion um, after having suicidal thoughts after his girlfriend leaves him or something. And um, you know, one of the lyrics is something like uh, I, I didn't write it down, but it's something like um, I can't wait to see you again. And then um, another song, Sunday morning is every day for all I care, and I'm not scared and. Yeah, I just I thought that was a really uh, meaningful song, and it just it it stuck with me. Nice. Well, you know when I when I said you know nice combo, it's not that like those are the right choices, you know, in a sense. But for me, like I think all the songs in here are really strong, so you can't really go wrong with picking any you know every every any any song that you pick as a favorite. There is the reason we could justify it, like. Yeah, that's why you like it so much, and you can't really blame them because, like, yeah, all the songs are great. Um, but you know, 
like I mentioned before. For full coverage of Kurt Cobain and Rana, go back and listen to episode 7. Now, we're just going to do like a very, very quick Cliff Notes version, um, which is fine. It's all you need uh, for, for now, anyway. But uh, yeah, our story begins in Aberdeen, Washington, with uh, the birth of one Kurt Cobain. Um, his childhood was tumultuous, uh, characterized by family rifts, uh, nomadic lifestyle, and drug use. But um, Kurt demonstrated uh, incredible musical talent at a very young age, and sort of his passion for music he kept throughout his youth. And he tries to create bands uh, growing up with uh, different lineups. Um, and what one uh, sort of precursor to Nirvana as Fecal Matter, which you mentioned before. Um, but in 1988, the name Nirvana is chosen, and the band now consists of lead singer and guitarist Kurt Cobain, um, bassist Kurt, I mean, sorry, Chris Novoselic, and drummer Chad Channing. Um, three of them, they record some songs together, send out uh, demo tapes, and get the attention of Sub Pop Records. Now, Sub Pop, they specialized in the niche indie punk scene in the Northwest, and they were very important in cultivating the uh, grunge rock movement. Um, And, you know, last week we talked about uh, Takes a Nation, the album by uh, Public Enemy, and how hip-hop has is interesting because it has a very specific time and place of origin. Like, it's just, you know, mid-70s Bronx. Like, that's where it started. And grunge is kind of similar in that way, too. Um, The grunge grunge rock was born out of Washington State, uh, in particular the city of Seattle. And sort of musically, uh, grunge was influenced by the themes and raw sound of punk uh, music, but also borrow some of the uh, sludgy and distorted guitars that are characteristic of heavy metal and kind of uh, made its own thing in a sense. But uh, back to Nirvana. On June 15th, 1989, Nirvana releases their first studio album called Bleach. Uh, this is through Sub Pop. Um, reception was warm overall, and sales were modest, but uh, in the, on a large scale, uh, the grunge scene was gaining much more attention, uh, even internationally. Uh, but in 1990, Chad Channing left the band, uh, but replacing him as the band's permanent drummer, and uh, solidifying Nirvana's definitive three-man lineup was uh, Dave Grohl. Um, after that, Nirvana signs with the label DGC and brings Butch Vig on to produce their next album, which turns out to be Nevermind. Um, after four weeks, it's number 35 on the Billboard Top 40. DGC underestimates the demand for the album, and for a time, the album was sold out. You just couldn't get it because uh, they didn't press enough copies. Uh, meanwhile, the music video for Teen Spirit, uh, smells like Teen Spirit, that is, debuts on MTV. Nirvana goes on tour, culminating in a performance on SNL. Nirvana is certifiably famous at this point. Um, Nevermind ends up selling over 24 million copies and bringing the grunge alternative rock scene into the mainstream. Now, for me, um, yeah, I like every song on this album. Uh, every song has a memorable guitar riff or vocal melody. Um, and that's something Kurt uh, really cared about. He was very, very meticulous about sort of his musical compositions and structure. Um, but for him, lyrics were not as important. Um, they're very abstract, which he saw um, very last minute as well. Sometimes uh, he sort of came up with lyrics uh, right before they were recording. And very tongue-in-cheek at times. There is like a little bit of humor sort of injected in some of his songs. Like, um, and Bloom is about how, you know, people tend to overanalyze his lyrics. And sort of, he writes that, he's very self-conscious in writing that. Um, uh, another thing of note is uh, Dave Grohl. I think his drumming is fantastic. Um, whereas their first album, Bleach, uh, Chad, Chan- Ch- Chad Channing was, I think, just serviceable. Uh, Grohl brings it up to a whole new level, just gets us so much energy, and he's a complete powerhouse. Um, on the production side, you know how, I think I mentioned last week, how I think it really uh, balances sort of uh, 
the raw sound of punk with also just being clean enough to sound beautiful the melodies to really stand out um and i think like uh kurt they were they were, they were having trouble with some uh with the mixing um when they were making the album but then uh they they got got it to the point where that's where we're here now but uh, afterwards kurt and i think the other band members they didn't like it because they thought it was too clean um but for me it was just perfect and the last thing to mention, uh, I think you mentioned this before, was the, the high-low dynamic um, trick, you could say, that they do. Um, this is, you know, with the song, starts out quiet, and then it gets loud, and sometimes turns back and forth. And Kurt has said that, you know, the main influence for him to do this was the band Pixies, and they did this uh, quite frequently. So, um, yeah, that is, that's Nevermind. Great, great, great album. Um, any last thoughts, yeah. impressions, comments, Jacob? On Nevermind? Um. Okay, uh, it was very personal. It was very intense. Um, it was, it's definitely one of my favorite albums of the ones we've listened to. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I've said this with basically, with most of the albums, but this one especially, I'll be listening to more Nirvana. And like what I always say when you say that, um, that's great. Go ahead and listen to it, but don't spend too much time because you have to listen to the album for next week, um, which is Sterling's Darling. Uh, this was an album that uh, Sterling really, really wanted on. Gus and I were like, yeah, it's good. It's really good. Uh, we like it, but is it an essential? Uh, I don't know, but Sterling was adamant. And so we let him have it. It is Dookie. The third album by Green Day. Um, Sorry, just because I remember um, Sterling, when, when we were talking about this uh, with Sterling, before he died, of course, uh, he said he really fought for me to uh, to get this album on the list so I could listen to it. So I, I better like it. Yeah, he went up. Um, well, you don't have to like it because, you know, he's, he's dead. He doesn't care. Um, but Dookie, third album by Green Day, released February 1st, 1994. Um, and I was doing some uh, preliminary research. Uh, I noticed that uh, this album is a very similar to uh, Nevermind's Path. Um, like Nirvana, Green Day left their independent record label and signed with a major record label for this release. They moved from Lookout Records to Reprise Records uh, for Doogie. And Nirvana, they moved from Sub Pop to DGC for Nevermind. Um, in addition, Doogie was their commercial breakthrough like Nevermind was for Nirvana. Their earlier albums did well in sort of a smaller indie scene, but this is the first one that got, you know, huge, huge uh, attention and sales. Um, and like Nirvana brought grunge to the mainstream, uh, Dookie sort of revitalized punk music to a wider audience. Um, so I just thought those, those parallels there uh, were kind of cool. Um, and what's cool for me is that I've listened to this album, you know, in the past, but I don't know it too well. And I don't really know this period or genre of music that well. Um, so I'm excited to go back in or go into sort of a, a, sort of a, a topic that I'm not too uh, aware of. But I, it makes me do wish uh, sometimes that, that Sterling was uh, here again, because I'm sure he, he would do a great job educating me now. Eh, we don't need Sterling. Gus was, Gus was the heart of the show, though. G- Gus, I, I, I would like to come back. Well... Uh, it's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, but yeah, that wraps up another Who is Bruce Springsteen? Get pumped for the final edition next week where we talk about Dookie. Um, Jacob, do you have anything fun or interesting or cool or punny that you've thought up to end this segment with? I hate the show. Now, uh, this part of the show, usually when I play a recommendation for what we're going to be talking about next week. But, like I said earlier, at the beginning, at the top of the show, you can say that uh, doing something uh, doing something special for the return to Dallas. So, <clears throat> I'm not going to say what's happening. Um, you'll find out when uh, we get there. And episode 30, nice round number. Did not plan that out, because if I did, I would have to uh, have known that before I even made the first episode, which don't have the prescience for that. Uh, maybe one day I will. But when that day comes, 
I will not know about it. Um, what you can do now is like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash wheelhousecast. Follow us on Twitter at wheelhousecast. S- subscribe to our feed on iTunes where you can also rate and review us. And finally, send any emails you got, wrestling or otherwise, to wheelhousecast at gmail.com. And I've been talking so much, almost an hour long, the longest monologue kind of ever done. My throat's getting kind of sore. My brain's getting kind of sleepy. Um, all I want to do is watch wrestling, but I can't. Gotta go to sleep. Um, so I guess I'll see y'all next week.